Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another of AgileQuest Workplace Leaders webinar series. We've got a couple of uh, contributors to thank this afternoon. The strong organizations who decide to move to flexible work and succeed at doing so tend to follow the same kind of pattern. They're not just intelligently performing their jobs and in embracing this big change, but they're also participating in user communities and user groups to share their experience at events just like this. We're proud to have so many of these above and beyond leaders as our customers, and we want to start off today by thanking them for taking the time and sharing their experience with us. This is all so that we can improve how we start hoteling and know how to navigate the change right from the beginning. On the panel today, we've got Bob Goldstein, the Executive Director of Operations Services at KPMG, Anthony Macri, the Smart Occupancy Lead for GSA's 1800F Headquarters Renovation Project, Amy Talinsky from Orange Business Systems, who's their Program Manager for Finance, General Services, and Development Office, Mark Smith from Noblis, who's the Director of Corporate Security and Facilities and Operations, and Don Crissom, the Telecom Engineer leading up Booz Allen Hamilton's Hoteling Project. We've also had lots of contributions from other customers um, who, who we can't all mention today, but we want to thank them for helping all of us understand what it takes to make a hoteling start beginning successful and get over all the crucial uh, obstacles. Everything has come directly from the leaders out there in flexible work, the organizations who've implemented and been successful with their programs. We, we interviewed quite a few customers and asked two really important questions. What were the key items that really made your hoteling start successful? And the second question was, what did you wish you had known when you had started hoteling? We got some amazing answers. We've compiled all those into today's slides, and we're recording today's presentation, so it'll be available on the website for those of you who want to review it and potentially distribute it within your organization to help get your hoteling program off to a good start. Now, we also have some more detailed notes, uh, more, much more so than we could fit in the slides today. So there's a survey at the end of today's webinar. If you find that you'd like to have that information, uh, you think it would be valuable for us to, to compile that into more detailed notes, please answer so on the um, survey. And if we get enough people who are asking for that, we'll certainly turn that into some kind of resource and make it available to you. So uh, just to one last thing before we get started here. The, the, the things we heard from the contributors all kind of fell into the same kind of pattern. There seemed to be very specific areas or steps that were involved in, in change. And it reminded me of a book by John Cotter. I've been out for some years now. It's called Leading Change. And he basically pointed out that, that successful large change in large organizations fell into basically seven steps or seven stages. Establishing urgency, creating guiding coalitions, all the way through to consolidating gains and institutionalizing, institutionalizing those changes. So if you haven't had a chance to read this book, you might want to take a look or even just skip ahead to Chapter 2, which, which basically covers what each one of those stages means. We've broken up all the advice today into these seven stages so that it's easier for you to follow along. And uh, just one last kind of uh, limiting thing here. We're talking about the advice from the field on getting your program started. Um, you know, in, putting in some kind of brand new, large scale workplace change and culture change is pretty big. You want to get the basics right. And the things that we're hearing from the leaders today are all about how to get started correctly. Um, there's a, a kind of a limit that you can, you're going to hit uh, two years in, five years in, where you've, you've gotten the basics down in place and to move to the next level, to get to the above 85%, the 95% the utilization, you need to, to refresh your program. Those kind of, kind of, that kind of advice is also available. Uh, we've got a breakout session specifically at this year's conference um, about advanced hoteling. What you're going to hear today is all about the pilot process and getting started with hoteling in your organization. So with that being said, the very first stage that, that everybody pointed out is something that, that Cotter called establishing urgency. This is where someone with the organization has a very uh, clear, this is something that we must accomplish. This is uh, an urgent need for us to can remain competitive, for us to um, keep on bringing in the best talent, for us to move ahead of everybody else. We've got to do X, something new, something different. Um, we heard a number of our contributors talk about kind of setting the tone or setting the goal, and the place where the, the urgency was the best or, or the most succinct, um, Bob Goldstein from KPMG really had the, the, the perfect perspective. 
and one of the things that he said was it would have been better at our beginning we had some kind of clear mandate um, like uh, the finance department coming out and saying we've got to do something about these occupancy costs these real estate costs giving us kind of the, the beginning point the driving force the urgent change that we need to make here with an organization to accomplish a particular goal. And um, do we have Bob online with the panel? Yep, I'm on the line. Terrific. I just want to make sure, um, because we've got a panel here, you guys please just chime in. Um, if there's something that uh, we're not covering here or something you'd like to elaborate on, um, please just uh, speak up, and uh, then we'll probably have some more questions from the audience there. So the 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 big kind of initial uh, motivation comes from understanding some kind of urgency within the organization. Sorry. And some examples of that, um, one of our contributors, one of the, the customers out there, uh, part of the big change for the organization was they, they had one big, large headquarters. Um, very nice place, great location as far as um, being able to, to being right in the midst of a metropolitan area. And they found that because of the congestion and the traffic around it, that the staff, while they loved working for the organization and they, they loved the, the area that they worked in, they found that that particular location was frustrating for them. That the traffic was bad, it was hard to know when they were going to get in every day, and that was causing some kind of erosion within their desire to stay in, in that organization. Just the, the fact that they had a vital traffic, and especially around the holidays, it got even worse. Other customers have, have um, started off with an urgency around specifically attracting the best talent and customers, where they had made a strategic decision to move and consolidate their locations into a much more prestigious location both for attracting the folks that were going to be the revenue engine, the services side of the business, as well as demonstrating for the customers the caliber of the organization. And they made that moving to a more prestigious organization as kind of the driving urgent force behind their plan. We've also had contributors who expressed um, they're in a, a very competitive business. Um, everybody basically has the same costs. And because they, they, uh, there's nothing new in their earnings, they have very flat earnings, now they've got to turn to some kind of way to cut costs. So those, those agencies or those um, companies are looking for what's a big change to our expenses? Where can we, we've got to make some kind of change, otherwise we're, we're going to fall further and further behind and um, the stockholders will be angry. Uh, I think the KPMG e, G example is, is perfect. It's echoed a number of places across our um, contributors. Um, as these organizations mature, as they're able to look at um, very discreetly, here's all the, the costs within our organization, the occupancy costs within these buildings as the, the workforce becomes more and more mobile is something we can actually do something about, and they set it as an urgent need. So uh, the, the fundamentals behind the, the setting the urgency really is someone with the organization, some, someone at the sea level needs to point out we must do this to survive. They've got to set up some kind of urgency for all the change to really have the power to move through the organization. Doug, uh, we do have a question that's come in. Um, what do we do if our perceived urgent need isn't seen as quite so urgent by other people that are impacted? This is Tony. Um, oh, <clears throat> this is Tony Macri with the General Services Administration. Um, you know, in, in the federal government workforce, it's, it's slightly different models. Um, so, you know, the, they, they may not see the, the employees may not see the urgency, but what we found is, um, you know, and GSA business is the federal government real estate. So we found that we had to make the business case, or we had to apply to different cases. We were making not only a case about productivity, not only a case about the, the way we change, the workforce is changing, kind of what the knowledge worker workforce looks like, and 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 how they operate and how they work. Um, you know that we want workplaces to be more transparent, uh, more collaborative in nature, and also uh, financial and environmental cases. Uh, and what we basically found is that it has to be told over and over again, and, and it helps if it's coming from uh, you know, the senior leadership is aligned behind it. Um, you know, we like to say we came up with a rough estimate that each desk workstation runs us about $14,000 a year to operate. So for some people, that financial argument um, really resonates. Um, for others, we say, well, half of your workforce is teleworking all the time. 
So it becomes a compromise. You don't, it's about right-sizing uh, the space to meet your needs. And when you're coming into the office, you're not coming in to do isolated work. You're coming in to do collaborative work. So that allows us to create more, uh, the, the space we save on private offices and desks, we can turn into collaborative communal um, spaces. So uh, bottom line, many different cases, many different arguments um, said from many different levels. Does that help? Well put. So, Tony, what I'm taking away from that is, in, at least in your organization, uh, you, you ended up having to develop more than one um, perspective or case uh, to drive, to, to represent that urgency and drive it throughout the organization to meet different constituencies. Excellent. And uh, before we leave this, we had another uh, thought come in. Uh, this was uh, particularly as it relates to nonprofits. And, and an idea to help drive urgency, and that was um, to talk about how you can use the dollars that you're saving to drive programs uh, and missions that are central to your organization's goals, um, to try to align people behind that same focus in, in a not-for-profit environment. So that's a great idea for, for driving urgency and change in, in nonprofit organizations. Oh, that is, that is fantastic. Um, and they, this person, um, even pointed out that their donors want to make sure that their dollars are, are going to organizations with low administrative costs. So if you can demonstrate that more, a higher percentage of, of every dollar donated is going towards the goal of the organization rather than the operations of the organization, you can give that information back to your donors to drive up hopefully more dollars to your, to your organization. That's an excellent perspective. I guess you could turn that around to, to, to speak to taxpayers in the same way for government organizations as well as uh, uh, stockholders for corporate or for uh, publicly held organizations. Terrific. Well, uh, we're going to move on from the urgency to the, the second stage, uh, creating a guiding coalition. Um, and this is, this is fundamentally bringing in different departments um, into the plan, the program, the vision. We're going to get into some more of the details here, but, but making sure that you've got everyone within the organization represented even before you roll out the plan to, to the workforce itself. The uh, very first piece of advice that we heard from one of the contributors here was um, when you're developing the plan and the policy to make sure that you're working with the actual occupants. Um, I think both of these pieces go to just about everybody who we've worked with, that the changes that are coming are not just impact, they're not just um, being made by the operations and building staff. You know, when you're making business rules, when you're making policies and protocols, um, these are all going to have some kind of direct significant impact on the, the folks who are using the facilities every single day. So I thought this was, this comment that came in um, was really uh, was really appropriate that the, the program that you're putting forward, the, the change that you're making has to be a balance. You know, there's going to be some degree, certainly a lot of focus on the savings that come out of making these changes and reducing the amount of space that it takes to serve the occupants. But that has to be in balance with uh, the practical nature of people who have come to work have to have just as much support. Um, they've still got to be able to do uh, the work that they've done in the past. They've got to be able to collaborate with their colleagues, and they've got to see it as genuinely a, the place that they work when they come into the office. So making sure that the plans, policies, and protocols are all developed with a broad coalition, the guiding coalition, and not just with the folks who are, who are being tasked with implementing the technological changes. Um, that kind of goes hand in hand with making sure that you've got top level support from all the departments. And this was kind of interesting. I think there's two different pieces in here coming from the same contributor where the, the, it's important with any large program to have all these different departments in the guiding coalition, not just to guide the coalition and, and, and direct it along the right path, but also to make sure that you've got support for what's going to be a program that lasts for the next 10, 15 years. You need HR and you need the, the top level HR support because they're eventually going to have to be the ones who develop the paperwork and the policies and the contracts that drive all of the, the transition of workers from regular traditional office workers and mobile workers. You've got to have the folks in there from telephony or uh, the, the telecom folks so that as you're making changes to the way people receive phone calls, that they know what's going on, they have a, uh, have a plan in place, 
and the day that uh, you start rolling this out, you've got support from the topmost folks within that organization. Um, certainly on the security side, um, I think, again, we, we had uh, a lot of involvement in security folks up front where you're detecting who are the best candidates within your organization based on how often they're in the office. You're going to get that kind of information from a badging system or an access control system. And, of course, on the IT side, you know, the, the folks in IT are going to be um, hand in hand in all steps of this. So they need to be there. They need to, to see what's going to be happening. They need to, you need to have support so they can vet the devices so they can make sure that all the changes and the software and the um, types of security that you need for using these applications are in place. And that whatever's happening with the work happening off-site, remotely at people's homes, is um, something that's uh, well vetted by the IT department. They've got the time and the opportunity to uh, make sure that, you're making the, that, that they are making the right software and support kind of uh, decisions along the way. Uh, so, Doug, we had a question come in, and I'd like to thank the people who are contributing questions. Please remember, don't hold your questions until the end. Ask them as we go along, and we'll address them uh, with the panel. The question that came in, this is to the panel, is that uh, people generally see the, the need to align these different organizations, HR, telephony, IT, and so forth, but each of those organizations often has different goals. Um, what have you done on the panel uh, to make sure that that these teams are working together uh, towards a common goal. Well, this is Bob Goldstein from KPMG, and I, I think it needs to be the, the, whether you call it a steering committee or a whatever kind of group, name the group gets given, it has to be set up to be successful in the first place, and it has to be created with support from senior leadership not just senior leadership of the organization, but senior leadership of these functional areas so that the, those leaders know that they're not just being asked to name a person who has to go sit in a bunch of meetings, but they're being asked to name a person who will be an agent of change representing their discipline, bringing that information to the collected group, but also being a person who helps assimilate other points of view, other needs in the organization, and bring that back to their own organization uh, for consultation if, in fact, there are, there are challenges with making sure that everybody's approaches or desires coming out of the initiative, you know, we find a way to make them mesh effectively. Um, I think we've gotten there uh, eventually as an organization, but initially uh, the people that were participating, representing these disciplines on our national steering committee um, a few of them clearly were just there to to, be, to keep a chair warm so that that organization could say we had a representative on the committee. And they weren't productive. They weren't contributors. And at no surprise, months went by, and the leader of, of one of these organizations would come up and say, wait a minute, I just heard about what the committee says we're going to do. I don't agree with that. And instead of looking at their own team member that they assigned to be on that team and say, why weren't you representing us effectively? You know, they they realized, I think, belatedly that there probably should have been different representation, so we get it right the first time. That's great advice. That is excellent advice. And I know that um, uh, a lot of the, this particular contribution, um, Dawn, was there anything you wanted to add to this about uh, kind of the broad company-wide um, involvement in the, 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 the planning stages? Yeah, I agree with having the steering committee. I think it's imperative. And again, having the correct people there is imperative as well. Because if you don't have the people that are actually going to be hands-on, you do get that, oh, I didn't know, and they should have known, and then everyone's scrambling to get things done. But if you have the right facilities, telecom, the people that are actually making and planning and doing it all, it does go very smoothly as long as everybody participates. Right. I would Don't. also add, this is Tony with GSA, that um, it, it's really, it, it's a huge, cult. this is all, it tends to be for most organizations, definitely for the government, a large cultural shift. So it, it's changing the way we fundamentally work. So the, the tactics are, of course, the devil's in the details. The tactics are important, making sure that um, all the details are covered with telephony and so forth. Um, but also having 
leadership aligned to explain that we are modernizing, you know, we're creating a 20, what we say is we're creating a 21st century workforce, uh, workplace for a 21st century workforce. Um, so a lot of times people will say, well, this isn't how I work, this isn't the way it is. Um, and that just may be their perspective, uh, but it's actually, if you, if you go a little deeper, you, you just go, well, how often do you telework? Or how often are you in meetings? And so on and so forth. So there's an interesting blend that has to happen between the quote-unquote traditional building management roles and folks that are kind of in the OD, organizational development side, that are helping guide the change. Um, so I would encourage that that steering committee also have you know, your, your HR people there that are promoting a, a solid telework policy uh, and are making sure they're addressing the question of how do you manage performance in a distributed workforce and so on and so forth. This is Dawn. Just to add another thing to that, we did set up specific things in our offices that were for hotelers only, like collaboration rooms. So when they are in the office and they need to collaborate, they have specific rooms that have the best VTC stuff and the best equipment in it so they have everything they need to work collaboratively. I'm sorry, collaboratively. And um, we also have different lounges. So they have different areas besides just the spread out hoteling desks where they can come together and really focus and work on those things that they need to. But we set them up as like benefits for hotelers to try to give more incentives to help with that. And um, as we did brown bags and a lot of different things, we try to emphasize these other things just to let them know that they're, we're doing the best we can to get them together when they are in the office. And that seemed to help a lot too. Perfect. Well, I think you're already starting to describe some of the execution. The, the, the guiding coalition here, it, it seems like we're, we're bringing together the, the upper levels of the organization, um, whether or not it's representatives or the actual C-level folks to to help guide and plan all this out, making sure that we've got the strong voice of leadership there. So you know, this guiding coalition would be developing the, the, the vision that um, the leadership is going to all rally behind as well as how we're going to execute. You know, what's kind of the, the rollout strategy, the, the how long is the pilot going to last, who's going to be involved in that, and then you know as you get closer and closer to um, the actual execution, the details like Don is talking about of, you know, which areas are we going to set up, how is this, how this going to specifically work within the pilot, um, you know, that's coming out of the guiding coalition or, or some kind of subcommittee off of that sounds like um, that's a very common thing within these successful um, hoteling organizations. Um, a, a really critical part of all of this, and, and we're kind of following on from step number one, is making sure that we've got a very clear mandate from the top, that we've turned that urgency that that the organization has got to make some kind of change in order, in order to survive and thrive, and now we're turning that into a clear mandate from the top. This is where you've got to have the, the, the top levels of the organization being very vocal and being very visible. Uh, we heard over and over again that um, they've got to not just say that this is a change, but it's a real change and it's not going away. And this is you know, like a driving force and also eventually helps you overcome the resistance. Um, and I, I think Bob can probably add a lot here in that um, there's going to be plenty of pushback and grieving when you get down to actually rolling this out and start um, sending people home and taking their desks away, that you, this mandate from the top, this urgency that's now been turned into a vision and is now supported by all the different departments that are represented on the guiding coalition, um, is a real tool to help the, the people who are actually implementing the change um, have a reason, have the power to get these sometimes difficult changes in place. Um, is there anything you'd like to add to that, Bob? Well, it certainly has evolved um, over the time that we've been implementing offices under kind of a new approach. Um, I think the best things that we've learned is there has to be an effective transfer of um, collected knowledge at that, say, that steering committee level to the leaders of the offices that are going to feel the impact. Um, and the best thing we can do is share with them the lessons learned from previous locations so that they're not, uh, first of all, they have to understand why the organization is doing this. And they have to, as leaders, as local leaders, they have to 
accept that mantle. You know, they have to basically be the voice of change in the local office. It's true of any initiative that any of us have ever implemented is that if you don't have support from the local leader, the project leader, whoever's the, the person in charge, it's doomed to fail. It's doomed to let, you know, the, the, you know, the prisoners run the jail, if you will. And, and so what, what ends up happening is they, they sometimes, you know, they believe, well, we'll be different or, oh, that office is a bunch of crybabies, so they don't do anything easily, we'll be much better. But everybody goes to the same pitfalls. You know, we've been, for more than a decade, we've been taking away private offices from, as we've, you know, had new leases and done renovations in our offices, and only our top echelon, we're, we're a partnership, and only the partners in our organization for quite some time have had private offices. And in every single office that's gone through this, it's predictable. There's going to be pretty much a 12-month period of time, whether you want to call it grieving or whatever the right word is, but where people will, you know, feel like, of course, somebody took something away from them. And everybody individually handles it differently. Some are more vocal than others. But, but it's predictable. And so if a local leader is made aware that you won't be immune from this, you, these are the things you're going to hear, then A, they won't be surprised, and B, they can hopefully be both proactive and appropriately reactive in you know, hearing but not feeling like they have to fix every one of these concerns because change – well, my favorite two sayings about change that, that I've seen is one is the only person in the world that likes change is a baby with a wet diaper. And, and the other one that I actually saw in a church sign said, change is inevitable except from a vending machine. <laughs> And and so, but it, I mean, it's 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 true that that there will be noise in the system when you go through these changes. So to know what you're likely to face, to prepare people for what you're likely to face, and hopefully, you know, they be, a lot of our leaders are in those positions because they're 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 get it done type of people. You know, they hear someone complain, they want to be able to demonstrate, I did something to make you 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 better off. But in the end, they end up kind of breaking the rules. For example, you might have standards for who can get, you know, a permanent seat or who can get a seat of a certain type. And we've seen lots of local leaders that see a relatively senior person, for example, lose their office and be now in a workstation instead and start handing those out like those are an accommodation to make those people feel better. It's like a, a virtual pat on the head, you know, we'll take care of you. And in the end, all it does is make all the other people in the organization say, wait a minute, I thought there were standards. I thought we were all going to play by the same rules. And then that becomes this slippery slope of people questioning other things about the program. So I, the, the, the leadership, they will lead. They're in those positions, local offices, they're in those positions for a reason, but they have to be armed with information to lead effectively. And that's where the steering committee or the national team that's kind of behind this change in business process, you know, can really be helpful in, in putting them through, you know, leader 101 and let them know, you know, here's what's going to happen. Here's how it's going to play out. You aren't, mark my words, these are things you're going to have to deal with. So let's talk about good strategies ahead of time to face that. Bob, I'd like to highlight two things and what I heard you say. Um, first is that leaders exist at many levels, right? It's easy to think about senior executive leadership, perhaps at a national or even a global level, um, or uh, trying to drive change. Uh, but we need to recognize that to be successful, leaders exist at many levels. There's local leaders. There's even within a, a building, there's, there's levels of leadership. And all of those, all of those leaders need to be addressed and, and need to be in some way included in the process. And the other thing that I, I heard you say is that the steering committee needs to be communicating uh, up, up and down. Uh, not only does the, the steering committee need to set the policies, I know we just got a question in regarding policies and, and we'll touch on that in a few minutes. Uh, but So not only does the steering committee need to be uh, setting the policies and communicating kind of down and out, uh, but I also heard you say the steering committee needs to be communicating up to make sure that the leadership buy-in and support remains consistent and strong through the process. Um, yeah, and I mean, I'll, I'll say, just speaking for the way it works in our organization, so myself and my boss represent our 
slice of the business, our support function, which we call operation services. So we're the facilities and the back office business processes. And on the steering committee, there's representatives of the, the revenue generating parts of our business, and there's representatives from the other organizations that were on the previous slide, the, the folks from IT, the folks from HR, communications, et cetera. And then there's senior leadership representation on it. And so when we meet, it, it's far from a, a top down. In fact, because my organization represents the people running the offices on the ground, you know, we feel the pain if someone throws something over the wall from a senior leadership perspective and it's going to fall flat on its face in operation in the local office because we're the ones that people are shouting at if it doesn't work. And so my role has been very pivotal in bringing the voice of the people on the ground that have to support this, making sure that they understand why certain decisions were made, but keep the, the, the channels of, of com communication open and I do this on a monthly basis. I have a standing call where they continue, even a year after we've moved into these new facilities, they continue to provide me feedback with, you know, things that they would have done differently knowing what they know now or, or uh, lessons learned or tricks that they learned that really seem to have resonated with their local population. And, and we've actually changed some of the policies and protocols that we went in with uh, because Unfortunately, because the potential for saving money in our organization was so great in the year that we got started, and what I mean by that is we had a number of very large offices whose leases were expiring, um, our, our request to, of course, pilot test this in a particular office wasn't allowed. And you probably, a lot of people are probably cringing on the phone right now. So we did eight offices in six months, including our second largest office in the firm, um, an office of 1,800 people. And so, unfortunately, we ended up having eight pilot offices, and the lessons learned are now for the offices that we'll be implementing this year um, will benefit significantly from the lessons learned. In some cases, those offices, we, we didn't go back um, and, and do tweak. I mean, if it was business process type things, we definitely went back and tweaked those quickly. Some of it was physical construction related or layout related. And in certain cases, small modifications were made. And in the biggest of offices, um, there were probably some more significant modifications made, which, of course, were more expensive to do after the fact. But we're talking about leases that are 15 years in length. So, you know, you've got to be in it for the long term. There's a question that's come in to the panel, um, and I think this is kind of a, an open thought question. Um, but it was that uh, this person has experienced clients or worked with clients that haven't gone through that kind of a 360 uh, degree review that you were just talking about, Bob, and learning from that. And when she questioned that, of why haven't you done that response, the answer that she got was that um, we don't have a mechanism to do anything about it in case they miss the mark. They don't have the money to do anything about it in case they miss the mark. What's the, what's the, the thought of people on the panel about doing these reviews, and, and are there, is there ever a reason to not do one? Well, if, if you want to be successful, that, then that's where you hopefully start with this, you know, then you, you build that in there. I had this exact conversation with our real estate group is the ones that hold the purse, purse strings when we're building a new office, and they decide what the project budget's going to be. And one of the things that I personally brought back to the steering committee is that we're doing something new. It's, some of it's uncharted territory. We didn't get to pilot an office. So we have to be accepting of the fact that there's stuff that's going to come out the other end of the tube that we weren't expecting. And it's, it's a failing, and I use that term, of the real estate group to continue to budget for these projects the same way in that on the day we cut the ribbon in the office, they've spent the last dollar of their project budget. Because there's thing, there has to be some, some kind of funding set aside to, you know, to fix what needed to be fixed. That doesn't come naturally to them, but at least it got dialogue at the steering committee level. But I agree with the comment that if, if you don't go in with the expectation that there are things you're going to find out and therefore you have to have time and, and resources, whether that's financial resources or people resources, to address them, then you're really in a catch-22 because if you don't ask people for feedback, they're going to assume that you don't care and it was just a cram down anyway. And if you do ask people for feedback, 
they're going to expect that their feedback is going somewhere productive and that somebody, you know, will take it under advisement and where necessary will do something about it. And if you don't, if you, if you feel like you can't do that, you're going to leave people disappointed from that, that way anyway. Definitely important. Um, great points there. <laughs> This is Dawn. We also, once we open a new office and hoteling, we go back 30 days later and try to get as many hotelers in the meeting as we can. We do it just like as a lunch brown bag, and we try to get their feedback, and we keep a running list of everything that they come up with that they wish they had or they wish they, they knew more of, and we try to implement that as we keep going through other offices as well. But I think the view is definitely imperative. So kind of a constant um, feedback loop as you're rolling out to new locations. Right. And we also go through, I mean, we have like little internal thing we have called Yammer, which is like the, like a little Facebook type thing. And we go through and we see all the different chats about different things that are happening in the office and um, things that users wish they knew. And we have somebody that monitors that as well as other networking social sites that we have, and we just try to make sure that we mention in our monthly news meetings, you know, that we've gotten feedback about the following things and we're working on resolving these or working at, you know, figuring different ways to make those work for users. So I think the constant feedback is important, too. Excellent. Thank you, Don. Um, you know, what we've, what we've heard here is the, the taking the urgency down to some of the, the early steps of planning and the action, and we've heard some detail on when you're actually rolling out to, an, uh, to a location, the different kinds of feedback, the different kinds of um, pushback you're going to get, and kind of the importance of having that mandate to go back to and remind people why you're making these changes in the first place. Um, another part of the guiding coalition that we heard really emphatically from several of the contributors that you have to set some of the expectations about the overall program. That time and time again people said we want to make sure that no, nobody thinks we're keeping track of individual people. The, the program, the technology, the change that we're making here, we're tracking the usage of the or occupancy of the desks, the offices, the conference rooms. We're not here to keep track of people. That's a, a fairly significant thing for workers. Um, but probably the largest, the thing that we heard the most, that had the most significant impact down the road was that these changes didn't mean you were going to be working from home all the time. That this brand new program didn't mean you, you're never going to be coming back into the office, you're always going to be working from home. Um, and that was a really important expectation to set up front. We heard a couple of cases where um, without that expectation, the, the work, a lot of the workforce assumed they could just go home, they could work from home. Um, and and there was a lot of uh, concern about ongoing collaboration and ongoing performance because of that. I think it was the GSA that, that has probably the most vocal aspect of the, the program that we're entering in here, whether or not you call it telework or hoteling or flexible work, this isn't so much about where you work. This is about shifting how you work. And, and you have to see that. You have to communicate that at all times that this isn't a program about changing where you work. It's much, much bigger than that. And then lastly, some of the expectations that we heard over and over again from the contributors were it's, it's important to set clear guidelines about who will and will not participate in these programs. I think we've already heard Bob and Dawn mention this and in, in, in understanding that there's going to be a point where uh, a worker is, is mad one way or another that they are either not allowed to telework or somebody else's group is allowed to telework but they're not that you need to develop these kinds of guidelines, the reasoning behind it within the guiding coalition as part of the overall plan before you roll it out. And then while you're rolling out, you have to clearly communicate, here are the guidelines, here's why we have these guidelines, here's why we're doing this program. That you need that constant communication, and it needs not just be here's what you're going to do, but here's why it's all in our best interest to do these things this way. I thought we have a question on this topic which is what information do you find it best to include when developing uh, the policies regarding hoteling? Great. So, um, Tony or, or Don, anything to add there? Sure. This is Tony. Um, I think, uh, first of all, I have to stress that real estate is GSA's business for the government. Um, and so our model is we have to do this first, but we really 
realize, well, we've always known this, that design matters and the way you design the workplace will affect the workforce. Um, so that all trickles into it. This is really all driven by two made, two pieces. One is an executive order by the president that uh, GS, that the federal government will reduce its physical footprint. Uh, it will reduce its physical um, amount of real estate it has as, as real estate is kind of the second largest expense. The other piece is a, a piece of legislation, so that was an executive order. Um, and then the agencies, uh, you know, take any other agency, state or treasury or whatnot, you know, they're focused on their mission. Um, so they need to know, well, how am I going to do this? How am I going to reduce my physical footprint? Um, and the answer very much is, is these programs. Um, the other part of it is a critical piece of legislation that coincided with that, uh, which was the Telework Enhancement Act of 2010, which basically re- uh, re reaffirm the government's commitment to telework for many reasons. Continuity of operations is one of them, but also in there is that, you know, acknowledgement that the way we work as knowledge workers is changing. Um, our, our work is more distributed um, and so forth. So what GSA has done is we realize there's really three main ingredients to this. Um, the first one is uh, really strong HR policy that focus on robust uh, telework um, uh, procedures and policies. At GSA, everyone has assumed that they telework. Uh, there is no established telework schedule. What we train and coach our managers to do is to say that people telework um, based depending on the work that they have to do. Let, let the work drive the schedule, not the schedule drive the work. The last thing I want to hear is, well, today's my telework day. Well, today may be a good day to telework if you have, you know, uh, research to do or whatnot, but if you have a big presentation to give, that may not be a good day to telework. So we let the work drive it. Um, the second piece is, of course, good performance metrics. And that, that's the nut to really crack is, that's, and I don't think anyone's really solved it and everyone's working to solve it, is you know, how do you really measure uh, performance of a distributed workforce? So that's all the HR piece. The second piece is collaborative communicative technologies. So someone mentioned Yammer. We have a similar thing. We call it Chatter. Uh, we are on uh, the first agency to be on the, on the cloud. Um, we have uh, really strong, uh, you know, WebEx type stuff. Uh, everyone has a laptop, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then the third piece is the hoteling piece, and so the right sizing. So as people, by their nature of the work, are more distributed and mobile, then you don't need the same amount of physical real estate. That's where you get the reduction of the, the, the footprint, the physical footprint. Uh, but you can't have one without the others. So at GSA, uh, for our, our headquarters, uh, which is the government's kind of real estate flagship, um, we assume everyone teleworks. Uh, we assume everyone hotels. And this is including our administrator, uh, which is a cabinet-level official. Uh, he, um, he is not in a private office. He is in, um, he is in uh, the shared space. Uh, his team teleworks within that space, so it is kind of a security area, but, you know, it's also, they may have, they have a staff of, uh, I'm going to make a number up, 20, but out of, they, out of those 20, they don't get 20 feet, they may get 15 feet, so there's a delta of five to accommodate when people are hoteling or in meetings or whatnot. Um, and this is very important because we're talking about the leadership. I mean, we fully expect to have different cabinet officials come in and, and see this and see it in operations. Um, so that it gives other agencies the courage to do it as well. So from the private sector, I would say, you know, as you do it, um, it's, you can model it so that it gives. But I do believe you need all three ingredients. Did that answer the question? I, I think so. Now, you guys are mentioning a lot about communication. We're going to talk about this a little bit later. I, I think Mark's on the line, and he's one of the folks who, who said, you, you have to over communicate. You, there's never there's you've got to communicate over and over again. I think we're going to touch on that a little bit later. Um, so instead of uh, asking Mark to chime in right this second, we're going to jump to the next slide. Um, but there's going to be an opportunity to kind of elaborate and detail that point in just a minute. Um, the, the next kind of things that the, this guiding coalition is going to be building as part of the plan um, is really two pieces. The first piece, planning the space itself. You know, figuring out where these hotelers are going to sit. Um, there's some real strategy, apparently, to determining where the hoteling space is going to be located throughout the floors, the departments, the buildings. And this is something that you need to work through very carefully because there are different strategies out there. Some of the strategies we heard were grouping all those folks together in a similar kind of location. And then we had just as many people say that it's really important to spread them out to make sure that um, hoteling is seen by an awful lot of folks, that 
the people who are coming in to use that flex space are mixed in with the, the permanent space folks. Um, and then some, we had some really interesting input around um, whether or not the, or how attractive those, those reservable flex space places need to be. That, um, quote, if there's nothing worth reserving, that people are going to tend not to use that flexible space. Uh, so the, a lot of the suggestions there were to, to make sure that the people who are coming from home, who are used to kind of a, a private, closed off, great looking location, that there be similar kinds of places within the office. And perhaps you're, you're looking for the, the kinds of spaces that have windows, that have closed doors, to make sure that there is attractive real estate and attractive appointments within the flexible space so that people are interested in actually reserving it. And then if, uh, there was some other input that kind of followed this, which was if you find there's a problem with uh, people abusing the really nice spaces, the great offices with a wonderful view, that you want to use the mechanism within your hoteling software to, to put those reservations behind an approval process to make sure that the same people aren't using them over and over again. They're not abusing their ability to reserve that space. And then kind of on the other side, you're going to be planning more than just the space. I thought this was a really, this is a, a great example of some experienced advanced hoteling here, um, some advice going from that kind of mindset with five, ten years of hoteling underneath their, their wings to the folks who are just starting. You've got to remember that a lot of the workforce is going to have some kind of special needs. Well, we're talking about the folks that need some ergonomic chairs, so folks that need some kind of accessibility um, within their, their offices, within their cubicles. Or on the other side, folks that have very specific job functions, like the software developers are going to probably need some extra kinds of hardware, different kinds of computer, maybe different software loaded on the machines that are in the, the uh, desks that are best suited for the software developers. And you want to plan out, are there specific portions of your flexible space, your hoteling space, that you need to set aside specifically to accommodate those kinds of special needs? So you're, you're planning the space and you're planning more than the space. Um, also, we heard a lot of advice about choosing who is going to hotel so that you have a great success, you're starting off with a lot of success. Um, part, certainly part of Cotter's leading change book um, uh, suggests that you need to have early wins and early success so that you're kind of building the momentum quickly and avoiding any of the problems with naysayers. So looking at the overall candidates that you have, the different organizations, the different groups, different locations, and maybe even the, the individuals, um, a lot of the feedback that we got was um, younger staff tends to adopt and, and even look forward to the opportunity to, to do flexible work, use some technology. Um, also, the, the staff that are used to a high churn rate, where um, they are used to, because of promotions and moving from department to department, department, department They've, they've changed desks quite often. Those are the folks that tend to be easy to bring into a hoteling program, as opposed to the folks who are older or who have been possibly in the same desk for 20 years, they tend to um, resist uh, a little more strongly any kind of change and certainly the loss of the desk. Um, also, we had uh, some advice in terms of groups, the, the people that we're choosing to, to um, bring into a hoteling or a flexible work program um, sometimes you can use whole departments at a time, and when you do that, you have to recognize that not 100% of the people within a particular department are going to be eager to embrace, embrace new change and losing their desk. Um, and there's nothing that stops you from planning your initial stages with choosing just the enthusiastic individuals within a particular department or a particular location who are going to be part of a hoteling program and, and use their enthusiasm and their eagerness and their success with it to kind of spread the, the popularity and, and get other people uh, attracted to your program. And uh, one of the things that we heard a lot was you, you're going to have to be ready with pushback and, and things like, well, why isn't this other group hoteling? Why aren't they hoteling? We're forced to hotel. Um, why isn't this other group hoteling? Um, and I think the, the advice here is going to vary an awful lot. And certainly that's one of the places where, I mean, if you had questions for the panel, um, we've got the right people here to answer what their experience has been. And then choosing how to start, um, this has got to be part of the planning that happens within that guiding coalition. Um, you certainly could start off small. You know, we heard from uh, Bob at KPMG how they kind of leapt into it a lot of, or, a lot of uh, uh, locations at one time due to uh, taking advantage of lease renewal or um, the opportunity to uh, trim down in size before you had to 
sign up for a 15 year a 15 year lease um, you certainly can just do one group or one location um, this is certainly this would certainly be a great opportunity for a pilot to do what a pilot does which is making sure that it's going to work within your culture um, working out what all does it take to work within your organization and then involving those people um, just like the I think it was Dawn who told us that uh, you're doing a 30-day um, post pilot uh, feedback session making sure that the people who are invi involved in the pilot genuinely feel like it's part of their they are part of the pilot itself um, that also gives you the opportunity to look for issues and outages and solve them really rapidly. Um, and then a, a really <laughs> kind of a, a, a piece that we all kind of take for granted, but something we definitely heard some feedback on. As you roll out these changes and, and, and uh, encounter the pushback and the hesitation from some of the folks who, who are going to grieve over the loss of their desk, they're looking for reasons why they, they shouldn't have to do this. And as with any great system, any great hoteling system, you want to make this as, as easy to use and as effortless as possible. And there's a lot of great integrations that do this. Um, all those of, who, those of you who are using badge integration where instead of making each user log into a, a website to say, yes, I'm actually here and I'm ready to start using my office, when you take that step and integrate directly with some kind of access control system, whether or not it's a turnstile or a, a doorway badge, and take the effort off of the user and just piggyback on the fact that they're swiping their badge in front of this electronic device, it certainly makes it a lot easier. Um, it doesn't seem to be a burden anymore. The, the other side of that is you've got to make sure those systems are working before you ask people to come in and hotel. Um, I think uh, Mark's probably the one with the, uh, the most specific advice here where you've got to make sure that both the, the badging system is in place, the integration is in place and working so that, that people don't see this as additional effort to be able to reserve a room, as well as the, the extension mobility. The, the phones have got to be delivered right to their desk without having to call anybody. All that integration has got to be in place, tested and working. Um, and in the case of GSA, you know they're, they're probably the most advanced folks um, that we know of at the moment where when you badge in in the morning, not only is that guaranteeing you a place to work, but it's also delivering electricity, lighting, and the, the AC and heating that they need for that person to have a, a pleasant, productive kind of environment. So it, it's very critical to make sure that you've got these, these systems, these integrations tested before you ask a bunch of workers to come into work and depend on these systems. Um, keep them proud to do extra effort. On um, the next huge step on the in Cotter seven steps is empowering action and, and this is where all the, the planning and the, the urgency and the voice of leadership is kind of coming to a point you're making some kind of actual change and, and you've got to make sure that the ground forces have the tools they need and have the power to say yes you're losing your desk and yes you must use lockers from now on and yes you must obey these brand new policies and clean up your desk every night so the the, the typical norms the the, the kind of the culture that's been in that organization for years, if not decades, is going to start to be changed. People, and people are going to complain about not having a desk anymore. I think we already heard that uh, uh, people are going to be looking for exceptions and potentially even um, you know, leaders will be passing out and doing things they shouldn't be doing in order to accommodate the kinds of complaints you can get back. Um, it's important for you to have that, that, those mandates and sticking to the plan and the reasons why you're making all these changes uh, well in place by the time that the, the facilities folks and the HR folks are out there training and making the actual change. Um, and here's one of the very specific examples that we heard that was um, very powerful. And I think this can only really come from people who have done it before. The power, the, the data is really powerful. You need data, you need facts, you need to be able to um, go to security or bed checks and, and demonstrate this is the real situation. This is what's really happening. This isn't just hearsay or opinion. Um, we know that only 50% of the people who have permanent desks, who have desks here in the office are in on a particular day. We know that these are the, the, the presence behavior patterns of the folks who are coming into work every day. And this is important at the beginning, in the early stages of convincing the C-level folks, um, A, that this is an important step to take, that it's going to save money, 
and B, after deploying some kind of system, to make sure that the, the people who are complaining about it and the people who are trying to um, break rules or make exceptions in some kind of way, you've got the ability to go back and say, um, let me show you the facts and, and we can talk once we, we see some facts here. Um, I think the, the two great examples, and um, Bob, please just chime in um, when you're ready. Um, being able to prove how bad vacancy is at the beginning is, is what lets you know that all this change is going to be worth the effort, as well as um, being able to show somebody that you know exactly how much time they're spending at a desk, or um, conversely, when a group comes to you and asks, we've got to have some more space, that you can say, well, actually, here's, here's how much space you're using today. You, you aren't using as much as you've been given. So yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, I mean, you know, the old saying that you can't manage what you can't measure. I mean, it's absolutely true. And, and I mean, heck, I work for an accounting firm, a professional services firm. These are people who work with numbers for a living. And so, to go to a leader with qualitative assessments and not quantitative assessments, you get shooed out the door pretty quickly. And so, you know, the best example I can give you was last year when we moved our large, second largest office in the firm. They, they, this was, and they went from an office that we had been in for 25 years and, you know, old tired habits and old tired space and, and plentiful space that wasn't very effectively used. So they, they, if you think of, you know, being able to hotel kind of like a muscle that you exercise, you know, we had a flabby office and we needed them to be, you know, much more physically fit when they moved into the new office. So, the first thing we heard from leaders, and this is a really great example. So, you know, it, the space today and, and all of our organizations are designed very differently. And we have in this office what we call the hub, which is right as you come in off the elevator. And it's kind of like a high top table. And there's, you know, there's ubiquitous Wi-Fi throughout the space, high, high speed Wi-Fi. And, and there's people that choose, because this is part of the design of our offices now, to choose where they want to sit. They don't have to sit in the area that we think they're going to sit in if they decide to sit there. And it happens that the hub is right near where the coffee is located. So you have leaders who come to get a cup of coffee and see their team members sitting in the hub, and their initial reaction is, we're out of space. These people couldn't find a place to sit. They're, they we're losing their productivity. They're wasting time chit-chatting with their friends. Really? And in the end, we actually made a purposeful walk around at all hours of the day, including weekends when the space in the office was obviously plentiful, and said, why are you sitting here? You know, we can get you a seat. And like, yeah, you know, I like it here. I work productively here. You know, these are the people that are comfortable at Starbucks or Panera Bread, you know, doing their work. And, and so you had these leaders who would say, well, we need to go talk to real estate immediately because this office overall was not sized large enough. We're, 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 you know, trying to find a place for everybody to sit. It seems like on a daily, hourly basis, and it just, you know, somebody did something wrong. And when we were able to present them at each individual practice group level, you know, department level, and we said, here's the list of people in your group. And we did this report for the first time 63 days after, 63 business days after we moved into this new facility. We said, for the first 63 days, here's the people in the office. You know, they love saying, my people are here all the time, which is never true. But, so you know, so then they could narrow it down to specifically their group of people. Well, exactly. We handed them at a meeting that was kind of like the, you know, the summit meeting, if you will, about what are we going to do. You know, we were able to provide them through significant effort, which we've since automated. Um, but we were able to provide them reports for their people that shows, you know, because what we had been telling them is the people who were given assigned seats, but with the expectation, we, in KPMG, everyone's a hoteler. You're either what's called an active hoteler or a reverse hoteler. Reverse hoteler gets to have a home base location, but they are required to release that, that space in advance when they know they're not going to be in the office. And that was the problem that wasn't happening. That's a new concept for people, that to, that, that desk is not your desk even when you're not there. It's not going to be con stay the memorial to the picture of your dog. You know, it needs to be used by somebody else. And so, so – we kept saying that as a general statement, and it was kind of a nebulous concept until we showed them their groups of employees, and they could see how their people were the offenders. And I had more than one leader say, this is great. This is exactly what I needed. I know what I need to do. And Bob, I had a question come in 
that um, a metrics-driven organization like KPMG may be able to address. Um, the question is, when hoteling is implemented, how long does it take for people to uh, actually get to their desk and, and get productive? Um, if they have to log into the system or, or whatever they have to do in order to be productive uh, that day, does it take longer or is it the same as uh, people with assigned spaces? Well, so being a, a, a um, organization where most of our people bill their time as an hourly rate, uh, it doesn't, if we waste people's time in getting settled, we hear from people at all levels and it always goes something like this. Do you know how much I bill out at? And, you know, and they're right. They're right. So, so we made conscious choices that maybe didn't allow us to get the optimum out of hoteling. This is in the early days of when we did hoteling because we've been at this for like 15 years or more. Um, but, for example, we knew that the telephone was a very important tool. It was both a tool for us to use as like a carrot and a stick. And this has changed, obviously, as mobile phones become the number that people are, are known for. But in the early days, we've made it so that you, you make your reservation and you're rewarded by having your phone made live by us at that workstation. And what, what happened is that there were lots of people want us to not turn on the telephone until they got to their desk, they said, I'm here, and mean check in, we'll use that terminology, but the problem was the only way we had for them to check in was boot up their then very slow laptop, fire up the application, click the necessary button, and by that point, most people, when they plug in their laptop while it's starting, they might do things like check their voicemail. And if you can't use your telephone, then we've just created an enemy out of the whole process. So we had to make the conscious decision that we were going to automatically check people in because of telephone purposes so that their phone worked. And they could literally go to the space that they reserved. We rewarded them with a working phone with their extension on that telephone. And they plugged in their laptop and they started productively working. Now, obviously, you have pro some problems where you have bad behavior where, you know, people squat or, or, or whatever the other terms you want to use. And that then comes from being diligent, where you talked about bed checks, being present out and about the floors. Now it's very different, and the way we're implementing space now is that everyone's required to check in, including the senior executives. Every single person is required to check in. And we have other ways that they can check in now. They can check in from a kiosk. They can check in from a voice over IP phone that's integrated with the software. Um, and, and they have to check in, and then we auto bump them after a grace period if they don't check in. So, and so um, you, go, sorry. sorry no, go ahead. I was going to say, do you think it takes them longer to get their day started, no. or is it just is it just no. part of it? We we've been able to check. We we the software has allowed us to check in and auto bump since many versions ago, but we didn't implement it because of this precise reason. We couldn't look people in the eye and say we 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 couldn't get something without it, totally on their backs. Let me say it that way. And now that we have capabilities, every floor has got at least one kiosk when they walk in the door and it's got a badge reader on it. So they literally have to swipe, press a big green button, and then log out. And they're done. And so now we knew, and then there's the voice over IP phones. So we knew that people were still going to make that complaint, which they did, and it didn't carry any water. I mean, it, didn't, it, 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 was, it was easy for us to say, really? Have you tried it? Let's go do it right now. And then they would look foolish for making a stand on a point like that when it literally was seconds. If, even if it was just the kiosk swiping your badge, we wouldn't have been successful because in this office of 1,800 people, you know, the floor plate is very large for each floor. And I got a chance to see one of our competitors' offices many, many, many years ago in their administrative back office location in Florida. And they had a homegrown hoteling system. And the elevator doors opened up and disgorged all the people coming to work, of course, around the same time. And I saw their people queuing up to present the badge at a kiosk, but they only had one kiosk. And these were the support folks, the folks that weren't billing out their time, you know, for, to the clients. And it was so apparent to me seeing that that there is no way we could be uh, successful if we made our, our folks do that. This, so this is Tony. It sounds like... 
Oh, sorry, Tony. Oh, I, I, I know. I think we're at time, but I just want to reiterate. I, I think it was awesome to hear that. Uh, from we're taking very much the same approach. Um, you know, reverse hoteling is part of it. Um, you know, everyone's a hoteler. Um, even our people would, that have long-term reservation, that have you know permanent desks, they're still required to check in. Um, and I, we explained to them that for measurement purposes only, but that's critical data. We can then come back with them six months from now and saying, you insisted on a permanent, in a much very polite way, but you know, you were saying you needed a permanent desk, but our, our documentation shows you're only here 20, 30, 40, 60% of the time. And then we'll have to make that kind of leadership call. Um, so it's great to hear. Uh, and while with the phone, we're all on soft phones here at GSA, um, the incentive, Soon, not yet, is going to be electricity uh, and HVAC services, um, you know, linking uh, utilization to those environmental controls. Before we move on, I want to come back, Bob, to what you, because I had a follow -on, two follow-on things came up as you were talking. Um, the first was that uh, in, in answering the question that I asked you, um, it sounded like the, the fear of the unknown is a little bigger than the actual reality. Um, and I think that's normal, part of human nature that people right. are concerned um, that this is going to take time and it's burdensome and this and that. And, and in your experience, clearly, uh, it hasn't been that. Um, it, it well, one of the things we did as part of this office is, because there's a lot of other new technology, is we had what we called a showcase. And we had usually had some food there. It was over the lunch hour. And people came in and they saw the voice over IP phones that they were getting. And we had a kiosk there. And sometimes that was the first time people were hearing that they were going to have to check in every day. And I was I was at a number of these events myself personally, and someone said, oh, you know, I could get this look on their face, and I see their badge, their, their security badge hanging from their belt. I'm like, come on over here. And they come over there. I said, put your badge up right next to that little green light. And they did it. They saw their reservation that day come up. They saw the green button, and, and I said, you just checked in. And yeah. they looked at me like, well, that can't possibly all all that it takes to do that. And not only were they a convert, but hopefully they left and did the old, you know, saying they told two people and so on and so on, you know, and the and it, the word got out there. And that's what it takes because no one's going to believe you from a memo. Uh, another question that came up, I think you're you're a great person to answer this because I know you and I have had this conversation and this is near and dear to your heart. Um, what amount of time does it make sense for people to give their space back um, when they're not going to be there? A full day, a half day? Um, what makes sense? Well, I think that's an evolu – the answer to that question is evolutionary, and that's the way we approach it. We, we are – if people have moved on to a higher level of skill and they want to talk about fractional days, like they know they're only going to be there in the morning, well, then God bless them. You know, I will take those extra portions of days and have them show as, you know, green dots in the software um, for that period of time. We're, we're looking at it as walk before you run, and for us, walking is – for the most part, treating a reservation as a whole day event. Um, and we, we don't, like, for example, we have not made a significant point to people about checking out when they leave. We can and we will, but there's only so much change that you can digest at once. And so we've chosen purposefully to just leave that alone, and once an office demonstrates that they've um, ad adapted to the change that's most important at the start, then we can start talking about checking out partial day reservations, et cetera. And that gives you a real, uh, as you're saying, the evolution, the, the ability to, to kind of refresh your goals and your, um, your expectations a little bit later and increase the utilization, you know, another 2 5%, something like that. Absolutely. I mean, I mentioned we've been at this for more than 15 years. I mean, we're, we're seasoned veterans, so to speak, and we're still learning stuff every day, especially with these new, uh, the new way that we're, we call it workplace of the future. And uh, the way we're doing it now, it's hoteling isn't, hoteling is now the cornerstone. It used to be a thing that we did to be more operationally effective and et cetera in our space. And now under the way we're, we're not only building but managing space under Workplace of the Future, if hoteling doesn't work, the whole thing falls apart. It's the core. Got it. Great. I totally – this is Dawn. I totally agree with that. But we also push the checking out so that we get more use out of our offices. And also you can account for people during security, you know, if there's a security issue as well. 
No, that's that's a re- that's a really good point. I mean, that's always something that people have have talked about. And I was waiting for my niece at her New York office building one time, and I was watching everybody in the lobby um, stop at the security desk and and swipe their badge at a reader at the security desk when they left. And I'd never seen that before. And of course, it was set up because of security concerns. This is post 9-11 and who was going to be in the building. Um, and obviously there's lots of other benefits of having that data as well, but you get to use, you know, security and safety as, as a headline to collect information otherwise. And I think a lot of it depends on the type of in and out patterns that are typical in your organization. And if, if all day is a very common thing, then you'll get some marginal additional data, whereas if you've got a lot of transient, you know, back and forth throughout the day, well, then you've got more opportunity to learn something. Right. Um, so that actually leads us to the next slide here, and this is um, a contribution with folks that, that we're moving into brand new space, and we're going to have a split of both the, that permanent space that Bob was talking about with um, reverse hotelers as well as the regular hoteling space. And um, their experience suggested that it was important to start off with the permanent space first. Go ahead and assign the permanent space within that area first. Make sure there's enough time there for people to get used to. These are the people who are sitting in the permanent seats, and then start hoteling so that uh, the folks who are, who are starting hoteling weren't accidentally trying to reserve some of that permanent space. Um, uh, along with the planning kind of the physical space and, and how it's going to be managed, you need to think about uh, assigning those floor managers or the concierges, however you may call them, before moving in. Um, you're going to be training these folks to deal with all the um, specific problems that come up, with the questions that come up, with kind of daily, if not minute-by-minute minute changes that somebody needs to accomplish and uh, doesn't remember how to do or uh, needs some uh, help to do that. And the advice that we heard, we heard several people say that it's important for these people to be on the HR side, or the people-facing side, that the kinds of questions, the kind of interactions are not going to be so much technical as they are um, helping somebody's day get straightened out. Um, also, they, uh, a couple of pieces of advice there were they, these folks will be answering lots and lots of questions every single day, and it's important that you have these people in place, that there are expectations set, that the concierges and the floor managers are the ones to ask questions of so that the the folks higher up the food chain that, that are responsible for the bigger uh, picture of the system and certainly kind of the, the owner of whatever technology you're using isn't hit with several floors worth of hundreds of questions every single day and distracting them from the real job of managing the system itself. We also heard that it was important to assign a, somebody who is on top of all of these floor managers and concierges, kind of a super admin, who was the clear end of the chain of who to ask that would um, end up being kind of the, uh, the font of knowledge for all these questions that all the concierges knew they could turn to as soon as they had a question that they couldn't answer. Um, and uh, a very interesting point that came from the folks that had recently trained, um, they had experienced a problem where the kind of super admin for the system had come from the IT department. Since a lot of their job was going to be working with databases and getting data loaded into the system, some of those uh, duties were assigned to somebody in IT who was only there at the beginning, and then the rest of the 5, 10, 15 years of the system, they would just train the next person that came along. And we found that that was, uh, uh, it would be more effective that the person who's going to be doing the job permanently get both the training as well as the experience of loading that data so they've got more right when they start. And the last piece we heard about the floor managers and concierges was it was important to set the expectations. Who is responsible for what so that as you roll out, as people start to get used to who do I go to, that the users know who are the people that I go to, that it's the, the concierges know, know this is what I'm responsible for when I, when I need to pass to other folks. Those expectations are set very clearly early and they're communicated very broadly. Along those same lines, we heard the same pattern show up where there were multiple layers of support and, and expectations set around that, that there were tools that were being built for the users to turn to initially, things like tip sheets and facts and websites with information that, that was kind of the front line of defense 
um, very self-service oriented. And that anything that wasn't answered by that, that there was clearly, here is the concierge for my floor, or here is the concierge for my particular location. And should that concierge need additional help, they would go to the super admin or the, the national admin, and that there was some kind of ticketing system, either piggybacked um, onto an existing IT technical support ticket system, or some kind of brand new support system that allowed any questions that couldn't be answered quickly to go into a system to um, show up on reports that they needed to be answered, and more importantly, when they were answered, that those answers are being captured uh, for reuse by concierges in the future. The next big stage within this enormous change is generating short-term wins. This is the, the early visible success that's important for um, everybody to be encouraged to see that the, the system's actually working, and this is what's used to overcome the objections from the folks who, who don't like change, who, who um, don't see the benefit of the system, and it, these early wins certainly accelerate the, the rollout of the programs. And a big thing that people said was that, that this success has to be visible, that when you roll out to a particular office, when you get feedback from the early hotelers, that the, you're using communication mechanisms within your organization to, to broadcast that, to make the, the people who are happy with the system and, and how well it's working for them to be very visible, to, for lots of people to be able to hear that. Um, we also heard to, to help with these early successes that it's important to prepare the environment specifically for it. I think we heard from Bob and from Dawn that um, we need to have kiosks on every floor so that when somebody comes in, it's easy to find, here's a location where I can find my new space to check in. We heard a couple of people say that locating the concierge staff immediately next to the kiosks, at least for the first couple of weeks, shortens the amount of time between some kind of question or problem with logging in or checking in um, and the, somebody, the, the, the trained concierge being able to answer that, pro, answer that question, solve that problem, that any new questions that they hear go into the tip sheet or the fact sheet or go into the, the company's website so that the users can easily find those, questions, those answers in the, in the future. We also heard uh, that creating cheat sheets or user guides and putting them on every single hoteling or flex space desk really had a big impact on people understanding what they're supposed to do and kind of contributed to Mark's uh, comment about over communicating, communicating at every opportunity. Um, we another heard Dawn, another great space, hi, it's, sorry, it's Dawn again. Another great space for that is um, when users check in and you have like the bulletin boards and different things like that within the system, we add links right there to anything a hoteler would need. So it's a great space. We have like one spot that's like we call it the way we work, and they go there, and we have a link for anything a hoteler could possibly need. And so that's another place that they have it, so they're not worried about where is this cheat sheet or where is that. It's all right there when they log in. There was a great example, um, Don. I know when we when we had the uh, conference at the your the BAH headquarters there in DC, when we very first walked in, there's a huge screen TV right behind the concierge desk with kind of a rolling display of information and links um, specifically to help out people who are coming into hotel. That was I wish we had taken a picture of that. That was a that was a fantastic resource. Uh, Don, yeah, actually. We had, a question, uh, we had a question come in somewhat related to this that I'd like to pose to you. Um, it, it's from the uh, the perspective of, of the hoteler, um, and how do you help them overcome the concern that might come with out of sight, out of mind? You know, we, we've talked a lot about preparing the workspace for success. Uh, what about preparing the hoteler for success? We call it managing up, and it's basically advertising yourself. So when you say that again, Don, I didn't hear what you called it. You call it managing up and managing advertising. Up. Yeah, and advertising yourself, so to say. For example, um, I just implemented hoteling in Airport Square. So I send a note out to my entire team saying hoteling is now up and operational, and give any details that my team may possibly need. And you just, you know keep your team abreast of everything that you're doing and your manager as well. And then we also have 
implemented with hoteling one-on-ones once a month with your managers. So that way, that's your time to sit down and say, this is everything I've accomplished. This is where I would like to go. Do you have feedback for me? So we've implemented that just to have that little bit of one-on-one -on -one time that's yours once a month, whether you need it or not. You can go in and talk about lunch. You can go in and talk about exactly what you need, but at least you have that time. That, that's great. That, that really shows the experience of your organization. I'm sure KPMG has something very similar. Um, the experience of, of being through this and making sure that you address the needs of not only the space and the operations of the space, but of the individual and making sure that the individual is successful to address that out of sight, out of mind concern. The, the last couple of issues on here, I thought this was a really unique perspective. Um, the last one on, on this particular slide is um, labeling new desks prior to a move, prior to a switch. That may not be um, plain from the short amount of words we had there to put on this slide, but um, this particular contributor was uh, sharing as they were moving, as they were changing existing space over to flex space, um, they, were, they were doing all the right things. They were communicating, they were training folks before the actual space turned into flex space. And they found their folks were so eager that they were actually trying to reserve the space ahead of time. So they made a conscious decision that as they were using the hoteling technology to um, create the reservable spaces for the hoteling program, which wouldn't start until next week, that they actually named each one of the resources, not just desk one and desk two, but desk one starting May 23rd, desk two starting May 23rd, that part of the resource naming um, helped people as they were eagerly trying to reserve spaces to remind them, hey, it's not available until next week. As, as much as you'd like to reserve this cool desk for tomorrow, you have to wait until the program actually started. And even though that took a lot of effort on the administrative side to change those desk labels back to just desk one and desk two after a hoteling program had started and people got used to it, that it solved a lot of the problems. It, it, it helped people as they were very first started using a system to understand when and wh what they could reserve. So there's a lot to the preparing the environment for success. I think Dawn actually came up with a, you know, she pointed out something really uh, important there that you're still, you still have to have some kind of idea that the workplace is, is still a place where you do work, that you're going to continue to have collaboration, you're gonna to continue to have face-to-face -face meetings, and um, you need to set that expectation. So uh, we heard a number of contributors talk about different um, plans, different schemes for making sure that people who work from home are still coming into the office on some kind of regular schedule or regular basis. We heard some contributors talk about specific days when we know that everybody in accounting is going to be in on Tuesdays because that's part of our mandate. Um, part of our mandate is the department called accounting has to be in on Tuesdays or not to telework. And then we how the tax department is going to be in on Wednesdays. All the way down to we're, we're specifically tasking group level managers with, it's your job to figure out the two days a week that your team is gonna come in on, and it's okay for your team to help you decide what days, what two days of the week do we want everybody in this particular group to come in. So we still know that we're gonna have face-to-face -face time. There's still that opportunity for very direct collaboration, and you're gonna tend to hear people say, oh yeah, well, we'll just talk about that next Tuesday because we both know that we're gonna be here on, on Tuesday, even though the rest of the week they're spending in the very efficient hoteling program. We also heard that the office can be made... Oh, sorry, Doug, I just wanted to point out there was a comment that came in back when Tony was talking that someone um, put a, a word or a term for that, which I thought was a really good one. It was, let the work determine the telework. Oh, right. Uh, right. So I know in the GSA, for example, there is prescribed telework days where, you know, you telework on Tuesdays, I telework on Wednesdays, for example. And that model just, frankly, uh, I don't think it makes sense. And Tony was agreeing in, in his, his statement that it, it sometimes doesn't make sense. And, and someone put a good word on that. They said, let the work determine the telework. I think that's a great, that's brilliant. a great catchphrase for that. Yeah, I agree with that because there's some days that I have nothing but meetings all day. So really I can be in a meeting at home just as easy as I can at work. But the exactly. days that I really to be physically there are the more important days for me to be in the office. I agree with mm -hmm. that. That's really interesting. Thanks, Don. Um, we also had some input, 
some advice around making sure that the, the folks who are hoteling, so I guess this would be either the, the people who have, who have decided to join the hoteling program early, or if your organization is not going to be 100% hoteling, um, that these are the, the, the part of your organization who's either been mandated or chosen to, to do hoteling, that you want to make some kind of perk, some kind of rewards for, um, because you are, you as a worker are bearing the slight inconvenience of having to reserve and check in, and you're kind of the driving force behind the organization saving money, we want to reward you for that. We want to incent that, incent you to that. So a couple of the examples there were kind of making exclusive lounges with well-appointed snacks and couches and TVs with, with, with um, access only if you're a hoteler to, to um, kind of more abstract kinds of perks. But things that are definitely, I get the benefit of X and Y for being one of the hotelers, one of the folks who, who have to uh, do the, the laborious part of swiping my badge or typing it on my iPhone as I walk through the front door that I'm actually there. And, uh, and then the kind of the last point that somebody made was uh, you want to make sure that you're advertising the, the benefits that each individual, each hoteler gets and the savings that they enjoy because they are not coming into work every single day and make sure you're communicating that to the rest of the staff to encourage them to all participate. Yeah, we have had uh, a, a couple of questions about ROI. I'm holding those to the end. Right. Um, but it, what you're addressing here is what we sometimes call the personal ROI, uh, which should be factored into your plan as well. So not only is there an ROI to the organization, but there's an ROI to the people involved in the, in the program. Terrific. We do have actually two slides right at the end that, uh, that help with that message of the ROI to the organization as well as to the individuals. Um, the next to last step here within the seven uh, changes is, is pretty important, and I think they've used a politically correct term here of consolidating gains. You know, this is where you're using the, the, the vision, the urgency, the, the plan, and the, the early wins of your program to overcome the objections and to counter everybody who is saying, um, I don't like this, we should all have desks, this is too much work. Whatever their complaints, whatever their objections might be, this is the place where you actually uh, counter them and, and push forward with the changes throughout the organization. You know, you've, you've got to be prepared for pushback. Um, there are going to be detractors. There are going to be complaints out there, people who are, are genuinely grieving because of the change, because of the loss of the desk. Um, a couple of the points that were made of things that you can share are it's a slight inconvenience that you're, you're being asked to, to bear in exchange for very big savings, both on the organization side and on the personal ROI side. Um, I think it was Don who pointed out that um, our CEO, John Vividelli, had, had, had said at one point, you've got the wrong perspective. You're, you're not losing your desk. It's not your desk anyway. The company owns it. And, and we all want the company to be as efficient as possible. And not only are you not losing your desk, you're gaining access to every desk in the building, every type of space in the building. So you get to choose, as Dawn was pointing out, if she's in meetings all day or if she needs to do collaborative, uh, you know, uh, loud collaborative work with, with peers whiteboarding or if there's heads down work, you're not losing your desk. You're getting every desk that's available when you need it based on what you need to do. And we always advertise in our brown bags right before we have an office opening that when you have a permanent desk, you're stuck with whoever your office mate is. If you can't stand them, there's really nothing you can do about it. But when you hotel, if someone's sitting over there picking their nose and driving you crazy, you can get up and <laughs> make a reservation for another desk. <laughs> yeah, that's a great um, point. And, and, Don, actually, I'm going to use that. There, there was a question that I didn't fully bring up, so we didn't fully answer it. It, it was not only how does a, a person stay connected to their managers for the out of sight, out of mind, but how do you stay connected to your colleagues? in a mobile environment, and you, you kind of hit on something right there, which is when you have a managed mobility program, you can tell where people are going to be. So if I need to work with you, I can see where you're going to be on Friday. And, oh, you're going to be in the office. That's great. Let me get a space near you. Or let's get the conference room down the hall. So so right. many of us, have we've, we've become mobile anyway, and in many organizations it's not really managed. Uh, but when you have a, a, a system or a method to manage the mobility, uh, you actually help bring people together by letting people know uh, where you're going to be on Friday. Doug, have you checked in yet? Oh, great, I see you're here, so I, I know to go to your desk 
is I can look and see if you're checked in. You know, why I'm not going to go look for you, Doug, if, if you're not checked in. So And just a lot of the mobility tools that are available these days, like with instant message, we all put a little note in ours. I'm working, you know, like I work in our $1 office, so I say $1 for my room number. If I'm working from home, we put work from home and our phone number. And so there's so many different ways that you can really communicate right. out where you are, and it really makes a big difference when you use them. Yeah. The, the technology is such an enabler to help pe keep people connected. Um, great point. Uh, and, and, again, without the technology, you'd be less connected. Uh, Correct. I, those are those are fantastic examples, and we'll have to add that that last one to the kind of technical communication collaboration piece. Um, you know, when you talk about making sure that uh, on Friday, if you and Dawn are both coming to the office, and maybe we'll just grab a conference room somewhere, you know, that that kind of brings up the next point here. Um, you want to know that there are collaboration spaces that you can use, and and if somebody complains about, well, why do we have to make this change? It's not just about reducing the space expense. It also means that you're going to have more money to spend on collaborative spaces, more money to spend on people, more money to spend on training. You know, it's a, um, it's not just reducing costs on the, the real estate side um, just to go to profits. Um, I think that we've covered most of this here. Um, the, the one point that I'd like to make that it wasn't, you know, we can't really name companies here, but We've got two customers that are company-wide, so their, their average worker workspace ratios are actually really, really high. Um, one of them is at 6 to 1, and another is at 7 to 1. And they've achieved that because they've got a company-wide mandate. This isn't just a, a program within their, their reducing real estate strategy. This is a strategic part of their overall company's success and growth. They have clearly said, Everybody is going to hotel because it's going to save us so much money and has no has no downsides to it. So for the people who are still unwilling to participate in this, they you know they, they don't like it, they don't want to lose their desk, they don't like the um, the policies and protocols they have to follow. For those organizations where it's strategic and, and it's a mandate, you know the the answer for those folks are there are other organizations where the workplace is probably more suitable to the way you want to work. Um, and I, you know, while that's not for every single organization, you know, we've clearly got two excellent examples that of organizations who have been able to cut their real estate costs, you know, as a result of six to one and seven to one work workspace, not just for a particular department, but overall for the entire company. That's um, amazing. Right. Powerful. We get that from level down. Like if you're a level four and above, you do not have to hotel. If you're a level four or below, you hotel. And the only way that there's an there's a committee that vets the fact that your exception is reasonable or not. And a lot of ways we've gotten around that too is by setting up special allocations by having we have software developers that sometimes work on a project for 30 days. So we have certain desks set up with double screens and all the equipment that those people may need because they're not always on that type of a project. But when they are, the concierge only can make them a 30-day reservation. They can sit at those days for 30 days consecutively, and then they're done, and they go back to hoteling until they're on another big project. So there's there's always going to be an exception, but you just have to think of the best way to handle that and still keep them as hotelers. That's that's great. Thank you, Don. Uh, we're gonna march these as quickly as possible. Um, certainly, in in the consolidating gains portion, where you're you're overcoming objections and You've got to make sure that you've got reliable systems. You know, these are quickly becoming mission critical systems. If if I expect to have a place to work today, and I show up and the badge system system is broken and it's not talking to the uh, office reservation system, then I'm not going to be able to do my work today. Um, so you, you need those systems to be reliable for people to do work. And also, this is a really big point that we heard over and over again. Um, people are counting on the hoteling or reservation system to act as an arbiter for space. We had just uh, surprising, surprising examples of um, space invaders, people who are um, taking the space that they haven't reserved and therefore dislodging the people who have who've done the right thing and reserved that space. And most of the time that, you know, is you know can be a polite kind of, um, hey, this is my space. Maybe we can get the concierge to help you find some other space than space invading like I did to Torrance this morning. <laughs> Sorry, Torrance. Um, 
but you know, it's good to have that computer system there to say, regardless of who is who is having this discussion, having this this disagreement, that there is a system out there, a, a cold computer system that is the final record of what really happened and, and who has done the right things to deserve that space at the moment. Um, that being said, there are plenty of opportunities out there where making a success, you know, consolidating the gains within the step means that the concierges and the admins have to be ready to kind of over help the highly frustrated people that aren't necessarily complainers or naysayers. They're just they, they, there's something they don't understand about the system that they, they haven't listened in the training to enough times to know how easy it is. They just need a little bit of extra help in making sure that the concierge and admins know that, that those situations are going to come up, can keep people from being naysayers and, and keep them from needing to look for another environment to work. And then um, as with, with any kind of knowledge work or workforce, you're always going to have people who are, who are very intelligent and, and want to kind of game the system. They want to, uh, one of the contributors actually said, we've got people who will come to work, badge in, go to their conference room, badge in at the conference room, and then immediately leave because they weren't, they weren't planning on using those resources. They just wanted to maintain their long-term reservation for them. Um, and to the other extreme, we had more than one contributor talk about the, the real need for uh, a different kind of performance management, a different kind of communication between managers and employees to make sure that while people are working at home, they're genuinely doing their jobs, they're, um, you know, they're, they're, they're doing their work, they're performing their work, they're not working for somebody else. Um, and these are all really important things that you need to, to um, tackle right up front so that later on you're not, you're not hitting these when you're trying to consolidate gains. To that end, you know, this is um, probably three different contributors here said very loudly and clearly, either from experience or um, just planning is everything they possibly could. Before somebody was allowed to enter into the telework program, to the hoteling program, or you know, whatever you call your, your program that includes people being allowed to work from home, it's important to have a contract in place. And, you know, the contract basically saying, in exchange for you losing your permanent desk, you are being allowed to work from home. You're still expected to perform. You're still going to um, do your work, behave the same as before, and you know hopefully you're going to you're going to be in the office a certain number of days. These are all things that you you will find um, people will game or try to abuse in some kind of way. So addressing these issues early in the planning stages with the guiding coalition is is pretty important. So you're not two years in and you suddenly got 500 people who are working from home and who have not signed a contract, who have not, um, who have not exchanged the loss of the desk and the ability to work from home for actually performing their job. So that's a great point for me to bring up another question that's come up. And Don, if you could help me with this, because I think it may have come from when you mentioned um, that you put in your instant messenger uh, that you might be working in a building or working remotely. A question came in asking, is it better to do that? Is it better to tell people where you are? Because if they're not involved in, in a formal mobility program and don't know about that contract, uh, that, that agreement that Doug was just talking about, they might um, have some misperceptions about what you're doing. Maybe they're you know, thinking you're not really working or, or whatever. Um, so what's your thought on is it, is it better to tell people that you're remote or, or not uh, and just be remote well, and not? The way our firm is, you know, it's like I said before, it's level four and below has the ability to work from home because of hoteling. Um, so in our firm, it's that way. I guess you would just have to do what's appropriate for your workplace. I know our team uses it a lot because if I want to just run down the hall, it's nice to look up and say, oh, he's not here, so I don't need to run down the hall. <laughs> so I guess it would just really depend on what works best for your workplace environment. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. Uh, now, another one that was similar to that, um, and I think possibly even from the same person, uh, had to do with ratios. Um, you know, what, what are the ratios that people should be using? Doug mentioned some ratios, six to one, seven to one. Um, and and I'll take a first cut at that because I've worked with a lot of different organizations studying those ratios. Um, the, in my experience, what I've seen is that there isn't one single ratio that's going to answer that that's going to fit for everyone. 
Um, that's why people in the upfront process will look at job types, job classifications, the way people work. Um, I've seen people even do studies uh, where they have badges on people to track where they go and, and the people with whom they collaborate um, and track how often different people within those job classifications come into the office. So you might have, uh, you know, different teams are going to be running at different ratios. So in the professional services field, you've got your consultants versus your tax versus your audit uh, versus your legal and so forth that will all have different ratios. So it's not it's not one ratio is it works for every business unit within your organization. You really got to look at the job type and the way people work. Uh, Don, any thoughts on that? Um, I guess, it, like I said, I would agree with that because we are using seven to one, but that's we've got all kinds of consultants that are in for an hour and out. You know, they're in for a whole day. They're in, you know, it just all depends. Mm -hmm. Some people are back yeah, and forth. The, the job type, day. exactly. Um, yeah, and another I, thing that I was going to add earlier pertaining to squatters, what we've done is we've gone in and we have like extra space and like a little alcoves in our office and stuff like that, and we just put a long counter with a bunch of phone and um, data connections. So squatters know that they can come in and use the lounges that we've provided or like that counter space. So if they're only there in a short amount of time with not enough time to really make a reservation, they just run, they can plug in there and they're all happy, and that's really alleviated a lot of our squatting issues. That is a we great thing to bring up, exactly. Yeah. We, bring, we call it touchdown space, so if someone's just going to touch down for a few minutes, they have a place to go. Yeah, that way you don't run, you know, for people who know the rules and want to play by the rules, you give them an option. Uh, that's right. a great insight that people who maybe haven't gone through this process may, might, might not think about that, that you do need to have that, and, and touchdown space is a, is a good term for it, um, have that touchdown space so that people can pop in and pop out uh, without going to a desk and, and sitting down to use it and then someone comes along and says, hey, this is my desk. Um, that, that's a great way, a, a great voice of experience uh, for people who are getting started. We actually heard lots of um, kind of different uh, attempts at uh, policing uh, specifically around space invading. Um, I think there's a lot of really interesting information in there that um, we can't put into the slides here, but we certainly could uh, talk to a little bit more within uh, the detailed notes if uh, we get enough input on the survey that people want that. And we did hear that folks are using security and HR working together to run reports on kind of a regular basis to, to find the people who are obviously abusing the system in some kind of way or gaming it. Um, that's definitely something that uh, you want to uh, consider building and maybe even advertise up front as a deterrent to that kind of behavior, that kind of abuse. And the last stage is really kind of the ongoing stage, the, the how do we make this, these changes a permanent part of our culture. Um, and these, these seem um, pretty simple, but we've got some good examples in here of how that works. Um, making sure that you're rolling out to the entire organization with the eager groups first. And then uh, I think Bob was uh, uh, pointing out how important it was once you actually know that a lease event is coming up, uh, making sure that you're including when are your leases coming due, the places where you're going to be signing up for 10 or 15 years and 20, 50 million dollars of whack um, with your rollouts. And uh, some great advice from kind of the advanced hotelers where they have lots and lots of locations and some locations are tight on space and some locations have lots of space. Um, the advice we heard there was uh, it's kind of pointless to try and roll out a, a new set of rules and regulations to the, the few locations who actually have too much space. You know, people will very quickly understand that, that there's no real reason for them to reserve a space when every day when they walk in there's 20 spaces available. Um, so as you're putting together your rollout programs or your rollout plans, um, looking at those places that have lots of abundant space um, as kind of the last of the list or wait until there's some kind of leasing event on them. Um, and setting company-wide standards, I think um, Booz Allen Hamilton is an excellent example of this. Um, they were able to take all of the spaces, all the locations they have throughout the country and turn them kind of into a network of space, um, especially in metropolitan areas where they might have seven, five or seven locations. And by putting them into a, a flexible space system, the hotelers actually get the ability to choose which one of the physical locations they're going to go to, not just the seat they're going to sit in, but is the um, 
building that's at the top of the beltway closer to the client I'm going to see today, or is the building at the bottom of the uh, beltway close to my home the best place for me to collaborate today? Um, that merely makes a big difference when somebody's got the choice. Um, in the same kind of uh, vein, when you have multiple locations, we heard that there was a lot of value in setting the standard of we always have a kiosk at the front of the elevator. We always have a certain amount of touchdown space immediately as you walk in, no matter what location you're at throughout all of our offices in the United States. So setting some kind of company standard so that when people are visiting from one city or one state to another, they know what to expect, um, they are used to it already, there's no additional training, and you just kind of walk in and know how things are going to work. Um, and one of the, the really interesting techniques that people used, because hoteling kind of demands a clean desk policy, um, demands that everybody follow the, the I'm going to remove all my personal items from my space as I check out for each, um, each day. That means that um, some people are going to want to know where do I put my stuff. Um, and you know, the argument here is, well, you're, you're gaining all this flexibility and a, an ability to choose where you sit, and in exchange for that, you, you can't leave any of your personal items here on the desk. Um, a very common uh, response for that or common piece of wisdom was provide lockers, provide reservable lockers at all these spaces. And when somebody makes the argument of, hey, I'm going to be here for the next five days, I've got a reservation for five days, I've, I'm going to keep all my personal items on top of my desk because it, it doesn't make any sense for me because I'm going to be in using the same desk, and then pointing back to the policy and saying, this is a hoteling organization. Uh, we all agree to this. It's, it's part and parcel and important to clean up. Um, your desk will be cleaned off every night, so you know, use the lockers we provided. And you know, at the end of the day, if this type of hoteling environment where you have a lot of benefits um, isn't appropriate for you, there are a lot of other organizations out there that might be more suitable for you. So, a company can we be implemented with that? If security walks around and sees stuff laying on a desk. They confiscate it and take it, and that user would have to go to security and check it out with the reason why they left work oh, documents wow. on an open desk. Or if, you know, the concierge sweeps through. I mean, because we've had some people that were pretty adamant, I am not going to hotel. I am leaving my stuff here because I am using it for the next 10 days. And we're like, no, that's not how we operate. So, you know, that's pretty steep measures, but that's what we ended up doing. So well, because especially. Yeah, I mean, if you have confidential documents sitting there and the cleaning people walk by, we made it where the hoteling rooms, there's no keys for any of the drawers or overheads, and there's no keys for the locks. So if yep. security walks by doing a secure room check and sees documents laying there, they want to know why. Yeah, Don, I was just going to bring that up. That's, you know, it's sometimes a policy like this helps reinforce the uh, validity and the importance of the other policies that you have. Like, I'm sure you already had a clean desk policy, right? Um, right. But there was no punishment for not following it because you're, the nature of your work is that your people do have sensitive information about their customers. So, uh, you know, you already had a policy, I'm sure, that, that, that can't be left out, but there wasn't a punishment without this program in place. It's just like card swipes and security cards. Uh, if there's no consequence to tailgating, then people will tailgate. You know, I'll open the door and you'll come in with me. If there's a consequence to that, like you lose your desk or you don't get your phone today, then I'll open the door, you'd say thank you, and you'd scan your card also. Um, that way right. you're logged into the system as well. So that tying these things together improves all of the systems. Terrific. Yeah, and that just goes back to buy-in from every aspect of the stakeholders in the firm. Yep. To everyone, really, really making everybody in the firm with the same mind, or, or like we've got here on this next slide, changing the mindset, changing the culture within the organization. Um, I, I think, again, BAH is probably an excellent example here where you've gone to great lengths to create a lot of guides and tips on, on how to do these things right, the right way to do it, the right way to be a good neighbor um, when we're in this much more open environment. And I think the, the thing that really struck me was um, you, for this to be part of the mandate there at Booz Allen Hamilton, you are you, you take the idea of when somebody comes when a new hire comes in, they're going to get all the training and all the tools they need to work in our environment on day one, so they're right. ready to go. They're they're ready to to fit into 
whether it's this office, the Chicago office, or the Maryland office that's closer to them, um, they are ready to go. Um, we also heard um, something that probably echoes through all, all of the, the commercial knowledge, or, uh, knowledge worker oriented organizations where because of the nature of their work, because they're billable, um, they, they commonly have this, when I'm in between projects, I'm going to raise my hand to say, hey, I've got 15 days here between projects. Is there any other kind of work that I can do? Maybe um, this is similar to what you were saying, Dawn, about advertising yourself as, as available in some way. So because this organization, because this kind of culture already knows, I'm going to, to tell people that I'm available for um, use, I want to be productive, the, the hoteling program there was easily able to say, we are doing this to turn our office space into the exact same kind of raising its hand, hey, I'm not in use right now, I would like to be more productive, is there somebody else out there who would like to use me as a desk or a conference room? It's the same kind of thing as the, the folks who turn off the light as soon as they leave. We want the office space to be as productive as our people are being productive. Um, and it's an easy way to kind of explain to somebody why they're asked, being asked to check out every single day, why they need to reserve spaces, because we all want to maximize our productivity and the office productivity. Uh, when, and we're kind of wrapping up here, and I wanted to point out the kind of big changes. There's, there's a, a lot of savings the organization enjoys as well as the personal ROI. And just a, a simple comparison here, an organization that's not employing some kind of flexible space, when they have a one person to one desk ratio, um, I think uh, Tony pointed out that it's uh, the average is about $14,000 per year per desk. That means when that organization grows to the size of 10,000 people, they've got 10,000 desks and it's $140 million a year. And of course, for the large organizations, 20,000. You know, there's a very direct correlation between the costs of that office environment, the occupancy costs, and uh, the, the profits that are available to be put back into the people and the organization versus those, those high productivity environments like Booz Allen Hamilton and, and the other folks who are in the six to one, you know, their cost per worker for that desk are substantially lower. And when you start looking at the bigger part of the organization or as the organization grows, the differences in the costs for the organization doing something like six to one or seven to one are really dramatic. Those annual real estate or occupancy costs are huge. And, and we had some questions about ROI and and, um, and and we get this often also, not just during the webinar series. Uh, you know, I've only got a few hundred desks. I've only got this, I've only got that. Um, when does it make sense to do this, right? Uh, and the, the answer is really here in the math. If each desk costs you $14,000 a year to occupy, and you can take 100 desks out of that. That's enormous. That's enormous. Yeah. It's a million dollars. Yeah, it's, it's over a million dollars. So the savings get really big really fast. Now, you, you realize those savings, and of course, in, in this is on the real estate side. There's there's all the, the personal ROI side that you mentioned also, Doug. But on the real estate side, you you get you realize it two ways. Um, you can reduce your lease, you reduce your footprint. We've just had one of our customers, a long-term customer, start reducing their largest office spaces by 50%. Huge, San Francisco and New York. They cut their space by 50%. Uh, millions of dollars a year, tens of millions of dollars a year in savings. Uh, the other savings, and this is one, Don, that I think you guys realize quite a bit, which is avoided costs. You run your buildings at such a high level of, of efficiency that you have to take on much less space than you need. Um, so you, that's that's how you're monetizing this. So, you know, is there a right number? Well, I don't know. Is a million dollars enough? It would be to me. Um, so you don't have to be huge. The numbers don't have to be, you know, you don't have to cut a thousand desks out or, or you don't need 30,000 people in your program. You know, if you can start taking out a hundred desks, a hundred million dollars a year, right there. Exactly, and that's and that's just the the organizational side of it. You know, when you when you um, are countering those questions, those those complaints from the naysayers, and and um, you need to have that personal aspect to it. You know, there's a lot of benefits that come to the folks who are actually part of the program. 
you know, we heard that um, lots of those people are very eager for the latest technology and connectivity. That helps attract and retain uh, the best talent. Um, lots of people enjoy the flexible work and the ability to, to change their travel schedule and have a lot more time for their friends and family. And then there's all the costs that are associated with um, commuting back and forth to work and the pollution that uh, the entire community and, and, in fact, the globe benefits from um, when you cut down and you're not commuting as much. So the huge number of benefits on the, the organization side and the personal side as well. And we've gone way past our one hour, so um, we want to wrap up here quickly. There were a couple questions that um, I didn't raise. Several people asked specific questions about Agile Quest software, our integrations, and so forth. And I think, as, as most people know, we go to great lengths in these to be as neutral as we can be and, and really focus on the education. Um, we're happy to talk about our products and services, um, but we're, we're going to do that at a different time. So um, I didn't ignore your question, but please reach out to your account manager and or your sales rep um, for specific questions on feature function uh, and integrations with Agile Quest products and services. Terrific. And um, I, can, I can back that promise up. Um, we will take all the questions that went unanswered, and we will figure out how to best answer them on um, whether or not with somebody on the workplace services team or on the uh, account manager side. We will get your questions answered. And we want to thank our contributors, thank our panel. Um, everybody, please, if you get the opportunity to thank um, Bob or Tony or Amy or Dawn or Mark, um, when you see them at the conference this year, please do so. They, they put a lot of effort into contributing their experience and sharing today. Um, this will be going up on the website as a recording. And uh, for those of you who are interested in kind of the notes or have some comments to share with us, please use the survey that you're going to get immediately after the WebEx closes um, to share those with us. We will follow up with you. Thank you, everybody, and hope to see you again soon for more of the Agile Workplace Leader Series. Good afternoon.